Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today um, with a, a special webinar and a special guest, uh, Deborah Dean, who's going to be working with us today to educate us a little bit on elder financial abuse, um, some of the warning signs, um, some helpful tips on reporting, um, and some, some stories about um, how this may have happened in our community and some of the things that we all can do to keep our loved ones safe. Um, just a couple of logistical issues to, to, to chat about first. Um, first of all, we're going to be following along uh, with a slide deck presentation here. Uh, for those of you with questions, we will be providing copies of that slide deck uh, to attendees uh, after the, the webinar is over. Um, we will also be recording this webinar and posting it um, on our website so that if you weren't able to attend or maybe you have someone you would like to share the content with, you can go ahead and do that. Um, and then last uh, order of business here is if you are familiar with Zoom, there is functionality to um, ask questions. So we're going to encourage you to use the Q&A. Um, you can take a look at your Zoom menu. There should be a Q&A box there. And if you have any specific questions that we can cover for you, you would just click on that and go ahead and um, ask your questions at that time. So with no further ado, I'm going to begin advancing our slides here. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes giving some background um, on what we plan to cover today. Um, we're going to have Debbie take it away for a little bit on some specific fraud examples. Um, and she can give you a little history on her background and, and her prior role at the FBI and what she's doing for us currently. Uh, we're going to talk about some of those most common scams uh, that we've seen here on the Central Coast and also spend a little bit of time on some of the new COVID-related scams. Um, I'm going to talk to you after that about how to place fraud alerts on credit reports uh, for you and for loved ones. We're going to talk some about resources that you can use to stay current on what's going on. And then lastly, we're going to talk about how do you report fraud if it's happened to you or someone that you care about. So obviously, um, financial abuse happens in all different walks. Um, there's, there's financial abuse that's, that's committed by people that we don't know. Um, those are typically going to be your tech support scams, those mass mailing scams, um, someone purporting to be uh, a new girlfriend or fiance um, that is attempting to solicit money, um, check scams that can come through, checks that look very legitimate, but uh, in reality are, are scams, and we're going to give you some examples of what those look like. Um, oh, we're not going to talk about sweetheart scams twice, but we, we probably should because it is so prevalent, and, and Debbie's unfortunately got some real life experience with, uh, with victims of this scam and she can spend some time talking to you about that. Um, also grandparent and other imposter type scams, we'll talk a little bit about virtual kidnapping. Um, what can happen when a fraudster compromises your email account and the types of uh, abuse that they can commit when they have access to your account. Um, and then lastly, um, those that we actually do know, the, the caregiver fraud that we may potentially see as bankers here on this back end. So first, we thought we'd cover a little bit on tech support scams. I'm going to have um, Debbie take it away at this point um, to talk with you about what she's learned and seen during her time at the FBI. Thank you. So tech support fraud happens when a criminal claims to provide customer security or technical support in an effort to defraud someone. This is a crime of theft, like the other scams we'll be talking about today. Um, so many of these crimes are done by criminals who don't even live in the United States, and this makes it very difficult to catch them as we can't make arrests in foreign countries. Older adults are the most likely to be targeted by tech support crimes, and it's considered the fraud crime most likely to succeed. We hope today to arm you with information so it won't happen to you, and if it does, what to do. Tech support fraudsters will usually contact you in one of three ways shown here. They may call and pretend to be a computer technician from Apple or Microsoft or some other computer company. They might even spoof the caller ID on your phone so it displays a legitimate support number showing that company name. Scammers often use publicly available phone directories so they might know your name and other personal information when they call you. They might also pretend to be from an app that you may have on your cell phone, such as Amazon saying that there's a problem with your account and you need to press one for help. I got one of those last week. Don't do it. In most cases, these imposters or thieves 
want you to believe that you have a serious problem with your computer that only they can fix for a price. The scammer may pose a support or a service representative who will ask you to give them remote control of your computer so they can run a diagnostic test and fix the problem for a fee. They may ask you for your username and your password. Don't trust them. The problem is that there really is no problem with your computer until you let them create one. Instead of diagnosing or helping, they infect your computer with malware that really may make it inoperable. The scammers may ask for your credit card number or ask you to pay with a gift card, a wire transfer, or even deposit money in a virtual currency or Bitcoin ATM. These thieves may also show up through a pop-up window on your computer saying your computer's at risk. The message in the window varies, but basically warns you of a security issue. They may even provide a number to call for help or suggest you click on the link or the pop-up to get help like the one shown on the slide. Don't click. In the third situation, you may get a call pretending to be from a computer repair or security company informing you you're entitled to a refund for a prior services that you may or may not even remember paying for. In these scams, the caller will, not, will ask you for your credit card or bank account number so they can refund your money on that account. Don't do it. You're not going to get refunded. And finally, if you've given control of your computer to them in one of these ways, some victims find that the criminals have installed malware. Instead, your computer screen goes dark and you can't access anything on your computer. Then the blackmail begins. They contact you to demand money so that you can once again gain access to your own pictures and email and social media, years worth of memories that they have, that they have control of. This is what ransomware is. So what do you do if you're a victim? The Federal Trade Commission is a federal agency that basically is there to protect consumers. Their guidance for victims of tech support scams is here and very valuable, and I have it linked right there below. Just real quickly, make sure you contact your credit card companies immediately if you sent money. Don't click on any of the pop-ups. Uninstall the applications that scammers might have installed and update your computer security software immediately if you can. If this is too difficult, contact a local computer repair company that you know and trust. If you've given your username and password, change every account in which those old password was used with a new and different password for each account. Read the federal trade information before you need it and pass it on to others you know. Next. So Debbie, before we advance to the next scam, just a couple of points um, from a banker's uh, side of the house. Um, I've actually worked a couple of cases on tech support and in the banking environment, it can even get so bad as where they, they um, maybe contact you via telephone, they get a hold of your, of your email address because you're on the phone with them, and they say, I'm going to send you a link. You click on the link, and suddenly they're remoting in and have control of your computer. Um, we actually had, a, a, or I actually had a case in a, in a prior life where a fraudster had committed just that crime and was able to remote in and start playing in the customer's online banking account right in front of their eyes. Um, so again, as Debbie mentioned, it's really important to know who you're going to contact in advance. Um, you do want to go out of band. You do want to call your banker from something that you know is legitimate, not something that you're reading on the pop-up or the screen or the link that they're purporting to be your bank. Um, and you want to be very careful. Um, maybe use the phone number that's on the back of your account statement or, as, as Debbie mentioned, on the back of your credit card or your debit card. Um, I worked a case also a couple of years back where someone had, had fallen prey to this, this ransomware that, that Debbie educated us on. Um, and the only reason they were calling the bank wasn't to get help. It was to ask how to purchase Bitcoin. <laughs> so um, fortunately, when we got that little warning sign, we were able to work with the customer. Um, they never ended up paying the ransom in that case, but they did have to spend a significant amount of time rebuilding all those files. Um, and, and getting all that together. Um, and one last uh, tech support type scam that we have seen is a, a text message or, or, or short message service where you get a message to your phone with a link to click or a phone number to call where they purport to be your bank. Um, as soon as that happens and they start asking you for your financial passwords or codes, you know it's gonna be a risk. Thank you. Okay, next. So mass mailing or kind of mass marketing scams, in the olden days, kind of before the internet, uh, mail and phone were the main ways the fraudsters, especially those from other countries, targeted and stole money from victims in what we call scams. This is still happening, but now scammers also have access to the internet, and it's much cheaper and easier to target even more people online with the intent to steal. 
people may get a letter saying that they've won a lottery, received an email or a mailing that they've just inherited money from a long lost relative that they never even knew they had. They might get a job offer online to work at home for a registration fee or even a request to help a charity effort that is close to your heart. Charity scammers often pressure you to donate right away. They may contact you by phone, letter, email, or text, or appear on a social media site. Scammers often refuse to send you information about the charity, give you details, or tell you what money to how the money will be used. They may even thank you for a pledge that you don't even remember sending. So how do you verify a charity is real and is really spending the money donated in good ways? The IRS has a website, it was on the, the previous slide there, um, at, and you can just do a search engine on that using that word IRS select check and you can find it on to find out if any charity is tax exempt. The website charitynavigator.org and the Better Business Bureau's gift.org are also great websites to check whether a charity you are considering giving to is worthy, including how much of their money is actually going to do what you hope it's doing rather than administrative fees, salaries, and fundraising. You'd be surprised. There are so many fake charities out there and no one's real and or not really spending the money as you think they are. Many of them advertise after national disasters, such as the fires and mudslides that so impacted our communities recently. They're also showing up now, preying on people's fears and wishes to help in COVID matters. They also show up on earthquakes, floods. So what are you supposed to do? Donate to real charities on their own websites. Find the sites you yourself um, find instead of clicking on a link and an email, a phone, a letter, or a social media solicitation. After the Haiti earthquake, scammers actually set up web fake web cross websites that looked like they were real. Genuine aid organizations will accept donations by credit card or checks. They won't ask for wire transfers. They won't ask for bank account information or your social security number. Donations via text might be okay as long as you confirm the number with the nonprofit organization. Next slide. Okay, so for lotteries, you've gotten that call, that letter, that email, or text from someone saying that you want a publisher's clearinghouse or that mega millions um, jackpot. You didn't, of course, because the real publisher's clearinghouse and the real mega millions will never call you on the phone. They will never email you or text you or tell you that you're a winner. Um, both have information on their websites on how to avoid scams by impersonators using their name. And they're very, very common. Lottery and sweepstakes scams are an example of these mass mailings or mass marketing scams. The website and the letter here look very official. They'll often have lots of seals, as you see on the letter, or on the other side, the one on the internet, they'll use names on um, partner companies that look really legit. Um, everybody, or at least if you're over 50, you know what Reader's Digest is, and that seems like a reputable company but they aren't really affiliated with them. Or you look at the banner up on top and you see the numerous companies that are listed there and you think, well, this must be legitimate. I guess I don't have to check it out any longer. Check it out. Federal law actually states that you never have to pay for prize money in advance, not for taxes, not for insurance, not for a courier or a car tax, nothing before you have your money. Also, it's illegal to participate in foreign lotteries if you're here in the United States. Anyone contacting you from another country telling you that you want is a scammer. So if you look at that letter that's there on the, on the right, you realize that that actually must be a scam because no one from a foreign country should be contacting you here in the United States. What should you do if you get this kind of call, letter, or email, or text? Hopefully you're screening your calls by letting the call go to messages for you to review. Don't call them back if it's someone you don't know. If you forget and pick up the phone, or you answer a text, hang up and block them. Don't call or text them back. They're impersonators, these are criminals. I have had one, I've had victims lose hundreds of thousands of dollars, even millions to these scams. And I know of one scammer of Jamaica that's actually serving 20 years in a US prison. Okay. Those are the stories we always like to hear, Debbie. I know one of the questions we often get is how often do they actually um, you know, um, get after the, the, the perpetrators and, and um, get them in trouble for these crimes. The, the screen off to the left is actually a case, and I called, I called Debbie, I think I'd been here only a couple of months here at American Riviera Bank, um, and we had seen something interesting going on with one of our older clients, um, and 
they had significantly um, drained their account balances for uh, wires for real estate investments and purchases. Um, at one point, we actually saw a check going to the, the person that was allegedly helping them uh, with this real estate investment project uh, in Florida, I believe it was. And what we did is we screened all the information on the front of the back of the check and found it to tie to this fake sweepstakes site. Um, at that point, um, you know, having, having friends like Debbie in the DA's office was great because we were able to get the, the local sheriff to go out and pay a visit to the client um, and try to convince them that maybe they were being scammed. In the course of the conversation, they uncovered that um, the, the client believed they had won a, a, a sweepstakes for $3.5 million plus two BMWs, and the money was apparently going to be delivered along with the cars that very day. Um, and unfortunately, as Debbie can tell you about in just a bit, when you're working with um, someone who really feels like they have won and they've invested a lot of money or paid these upfront fees, trying to uh, convince them that this may be a scam, it can sometimes be really challenging. And working with Debbie for many years, uh, one of the things I've always appreciated um, about her is her willingness to have spent time with clients and, and really talk to them about what's going on. Um, she's also got some um, programs that she's instituted that I, I'd love her to talk about in just a minute when we get to the next slide. And one thing too is you have to realize a lot of those folks spent weeks or months getting into those scams. So one-time interventions often aren't going to happen or work, whether it's by a banker or by law enforcement or the family or, you know, me. Um, there's no magic wand to wave. It's going to take them some time and you need to be patient with them as they figure this out. So, sweetheart scams, all right. Romance imposter or sweetheart scams are perhaps the most devastating internet scam of all. They create, the scammers create fake profiles on dating sites and social media, often using stolen photos to obtain your money, information on your assets, and personal financial information. They often pretend to have businesses and they're usually saying that they're overseas or they're serving in the military or they're involved in some humanitarian nonprofit in another country as the reason that they can't meet you in person. Um, and usually in the past, they have targeted men and women that are age 50 and over and usually divorced or widowed um, and also often very lonely. Lately, it seems these scams are also, also impacting younger adults. We're starting to see that more and more. During the isolation that many of us are encountering during COVID, we can only presume that this crime is happening even more these days. Um, so these are some of the common red flags or how they often get started. If you're on a dating site or social media, such as Facebook, Words with Friends, or other site, they're going to urge you to move from the original site where you met online and gain your trust by telling you what you want to hear. They are, are, they're, once that virtual intimacy is established and you begin to share all your deepest emotions, um, they're going to profess their true, one true love to you. And you're going to think of this person as kind of your soulmate, destined to be together despite the distance or despite the age, the difference there might be between you. Meanwhile, the romance imposter is isolating you from your real friends, your family, and your daily activities to gain your trust. They might know intimate, important details about you, your family, your finances. You may even share intimate or sexual videos and photos with them. After all, you consider them perhaps your fiancé. These may later be used to threaten you if you don't comply with their demands for money or to keep quiet. They will share stories of bad luck, emergencies for themselves or family members such as children who really don't exist, or to help their business or because of some difficulty with authorities overseas or needing financial help in getting back to the United States. They know you're gonna be supportive. They know you're willing to financially sacrifice for the chance of you both to be together. Yet something always comes up. There's always another reason they can't be with you physically, even for a brief meeting. These scammers will ask and manipulate you to offer small amounts of money to help them at first. This is a test to see if you're gonna comply. They may ask for cash, gift cards, advances on credit cards, or to borrow money. Don't do it. They're imposters, they're criminals. This is the number one crime reported both to the Federal Trade Commission and the Internet Crime Complaint Center by loss amount. And we're gonna discuss those agencies in a bit. And the amounts stolen are staggering. They are after a victim's life savings, whether it be $10,000 or $100,000 or even a million. They may spend weeks or months, even years, to accomplish this goal. They will always promise to repay, and it's a loan. They all even signed a contract that's, of course, unenforceable. 
or show you fake bank accounts with money in it. They are criminals and the money is usually gone, probably to another country. The emotional betrayal for victims in these crimes can be devastating to victims once they learn this intimate relationship, the person they hope to grow old with is not real. Then the identity theft, the sextortion or blackmail, the computer viruses uh, may also start to happen. In some cases, victims are asked to be money mules or money movers, asked to open bank accounts and transfer money at the request of their friend that has really stolen money from another victim, and then forward that to the scammer and his friends, usually overseas. You have no idea that's what's really happening. This is money laundering. This is a crime. Report it. Notify your bank. Notify the police and report it to ic3.gov. The Federal Trade Commission has excellent information on romance scams, the red flags, and what to do if you're a victim. In addition, Laurel had mentioned um, some of the programs we have. We've got, we're very fortunate in Southern California to have started two romance scams kind of peer support groups. Um, one of those is in Ventura County and is open to anybody basically in California um, at the Coalition for Family Harmony. So leave it so, so Debbie, I know that this is obviously a kind of crime that really tears at your heartstrings. Um, and I think that maybe sharing one of the stories of, of a, a situation that you experienced with, with one of the victims, or, you know, I can share a couple from the banker's perspective. Um, I once what? was I'll notified. Be sharing, I'll be sharing one a little later about the reporting. So why don't you go ahead and share a banker one now? Perfect. Perfect. So um, I had a, a case reported to me a couple of years back where a client uh, brand new to the bank, and uh, that was probably the first red flag. It, it seemed like her bank wasn't willing to help her um, send the money that she was looking for. Um, but as as Debbie mentioned, I thought she had a fiance um, and had been dating somebody online for a period of months. I think the website at the time was seniors.com and she'd been reached out to. Um, and she was coming in to get cash advances off of all of her credit cards so that she could make up $7,000 to send to this fiance um, that allegedly had gotten a job opportunity and he needed the cash in order to start his new job building bridges um, in, in like Bahrain or someplace, someplace uh, foreign. And as, as Debbie mentioned, that, that's an indicator. Um, I can't come to you in the US until I earn my way. You need to send me money. Uh, tends to be a very uh, common thing. Um, another case was somebody, um, as Debbie mentioned, uh, targeting uh, widows. Um, near as we can tell, the, the, the person's um, deceased husband, his email had been hacked. And the, the fraudster was purporting to be a business associate of the client um, based on a review of the emails and started corresponding with her back and forth uh, via email for a period of months. Um, and, you know, as, as a banker, we train all of our tellers um, in the red flag so that they can help identify it before the money goes out. As Debbie mentioned, one of the things that, that worries me the most um, in financial crimes uh, during this pandemic is the, 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 the change in the human connection, right? We're talking to you behind plexiglass windshields with masks covering our faces, and there's probably a line of people standing six feet apart waiting. So that, that human connection um, that we used to rely on in, in the bank uh, in order to determine whether these these, these crimes were potentially happening is not there. But in this, in this particular case, uh, the client had um, asked to send out a $10,000 wire. After more investigation, it was for their fiance. Um, it was going to China because the person had to pay taxes in China before he could come to the US and marry her. Um, and fortunately, we were able to get a hold of one of those emails uh, and have our IT folks do some uh, reverse engineering to find out that it was actually being sent from within the United States and not China. Um, and that's the point at which the, the, the client realized that she had been scammed, um, but at that point didn't want to give up on the relationship. She knew that she was being um, extorted for money, but didn't want to give up on that four month long relationship um, and, and was willing to continue doing it. And I think as bankers, that's probably one of the hardest things for us because as Debbie mentioned, it's, it's a continuous thing and it really does need to be about your loved ones and checking in with people on a regular basis. Um, to make sure these kinds of things aren't happening. Oh, the grandparent scam or the family emergency scam. And these scams um, 
basically your scammer is going to pose as a panic, sometimes crying, or an injured family member or friend. Um, and most often it's usually a grandchild that's in trouble. They may call or send messages urging you to wire money, send cash, or purchase a gift or reloadable debit card immediately. Impersonating that grandchild, they'll say they need money to help with an emergency. Perhaps they were in a car accident and need to pay a hospital bill, or they were arrested for a DUI and in jail in a foreign country, or they've had their wallet and passport stolen and need you to send money right away. During COVID, people are reporting getting calls stating that their loved one is in the hospital with COVID and they need money quickly for their treatment. Often they'll turn the call um, or text over to another scammer who pretends to be a doctor, an attorney, a police officer, or a judge to arrange how you need to send that money quickly. If you say, grandson Johnny, you don't sound like yourself. They're gonna respond and say, oh, grandma, I broke my nose, um, or have some other story as to why they don't sound normal. They'll also make you promise not to tell their parents or anyone else so that they don't get into trouble. In many cases, they'll keep you on the phone until you buy that gift card, scratch that number off, or send a picture on the back of that number to the scammers um, until that financial transaction is complete. Um, so that you don't try to contact the real grandchild. These scammers are very good at pulling at your heartstrings and manipulating your love and your loyalty to your family members. Their lies can be really, really compelling. So how do you avoid a grandparent scam or family emergency scam? If someone calls or sends a message claiming to be a grandchild or other family member desperate for money, resist the urge to act immediately, no matter how dramatic their story is. Verify the caller's identity. Ask questions that a stranger couldn't possibly ask, such as your dog's name or their nickname or what their favorite food is, but make it something that's not appearing on social media because oftentimes scammers don't have access to that. If you can, call or text a phone number to your family member or friend that you know to be genuine, even if you've been told to keep it a secret. And don't ever send cash, gift cards, or money transfers. Once the scammers get that money, it's really gone. If you're a victim, report it to the police, the Federal Trade Commission, and the Internet Crime Complaint Center. Also report it to the bank, your money transmitter services, if you've used Western Union or MoneyGram. Keep your documentation and block any further calls. You're definitely at risk for future scams of similar or different kinds if you've been a victim of this or and actually any of these scams. There are investigations and prosecutions actually that have happened on these. I once worked on a case of a grandparent scam in which the criminal was actually in another country and he was extradited back to the United States, went to a trial, was found guilty and was spent five years in prison, in a federal prison. Um, most of how did we find those victims? We found them because of complaints that had been filed with the FTC and IC3. So they are getting long sentences. And if you're younger, Warn your older adults in your family about these scams. For all ages, be careful what you post on social media. Make sure you have your privacy settings set to friends only. In many cases, we believe the scammers are getting personal de details from social media sites to obtain this information. Or they may simply wait for you to say, Johnny, is that you? And then start their scam. Those are all really good points. Um, being cyber aware is really important right now because we, we, we don't realize that once a name gets on a list and we've become uh, potentially a victim for one crime, we might be um, a potential victim in a future crime because now they know that they've got a live one on the other end. Um, and you'd be amazed just by Googling a person's name, how much shows up. Um, my own, uh, my own um, grandmother-in-law uh, was was contacted by a fraudster purporting to be my husband at one point um, and knew quite a bit about where we lived, um, the names of kids, um, all because in Google searches that information was readily available. Um, in the back of the screen, you see a, a, a picture of a money pack gift card. Um, I think one of the other things that's really important, as Debbie mentioned, if they're trying to pressure you to send the money right now, that should be a red flag. Usually they want you to act within 24 to 48 hours and get the money in a way that they can't later uh, think about and cancel. That's why they don't want a check. They don't want to run the risk that you place a stop payment on the check um, so that they can't get their money. But these money pack gift cards were used um, frequently a couple years back as a way to um, immediately transfer money to the fraudster. And the way it worked is they sent you into Walmart or somewhere else 
to go buy these gift cards. Um, and then they call you back and then you scratch off the back of the, of the card to receive the number. And as soon as you give them the number on the back of the gift card, the fraudster can then transfer the money. Now there was a big case um, and MoneyPack uh, participated in uh, making victims whole. Um, there is a place you can go on their website if you've ever fallen prey. But also if you act quickly enough and tell your banker or tell your friend or family um, and, and act before um, before then, sometimes you can recover these, these monies. Sometimes they haven't been all, all taken. Um, one other thing that we're starting to see is the purchase of iTunes gift cards. Um, in addition to gift cards or wires or some of the other ways they're trying to get at your money. Um, and it seems kind of odd. Why would someone want iTunes? You know, why, why do you want to be paid in music? But what that does is it allows the fraudster to convert those iTunes gift cards into Apple money. And then it's, it's all just um, easy to use and easy for them to spend. Um, they're always just really smart. Um, and maybe they don't have to be smart themselves, but they are instructional manuals for how to commit these frauds um, in the dark web where they can just go and purchase a, a how-to kit that includes scripts of emails and how to send and what to say. Um, so people really should not feel embarrassed to speak about these types of situations when they happen because no one of us is immune. And they spend so much time making things look legitimate, um, trying to convince us of their plight and preying on our emotions so that that lizard brain kicks in. Um, and particularly in the, the next variation we're gonna talk about, which is these uh, virtual kidnappings. Um, I think a couple of years back, they were, they were really uh, prevalent in Beverly Hills areas and, and places where there was lots of money. Um, and what was happening initially with these cases is they believed they were originating out of uh, Mexican prisons. And um, at the time, they were targeting um, Spanish-speaking individuals, and they were um, trying to purport to be um, having a hold of, of or kidnapped a loved one, um, a victim. And they would do all kinds of things. Um, you know, I'm with the Mexican drug cartel, and if, if you don't send the money now, I'm going to cut off a body part, or your grandchild is going to be killed or sold into um, human um, sex trafficking, they'll, they'll really prey on that fear to get you to act and give them that money right away. And these virtual kidnappings can be just, just terrifying. Um, they're always in a hurry, multiple calls, maybe keeping you on the phone so that you can't call someone that you know to verify the story. Um, and usually there'll be a, a demand for ransom uh, via wire transfer or prepaid cards like we talked about previously or, or money drops. They may also be actually watching you do the money drop and be able to speak with you on the phone and, and comment on the clothes that you're wearing. So there's, there's a lot of ways that these, these virtual kidnapping um, seem so legitimate. Um, the cases started to move to the Santa Barbara and Ventura counties. Um, I think it was last year. Um, they were also seen in San Luis in the last couple of years, San Luis Obispo County um, and um, different variations. But um, I once, uh, worked on a case where someone had uh, believed that their daughter had been uh, kidnapped. Um, and unfortunately, as Debbie mentioned, social media can really come into play here. Um, his daughter had been um, camping in Mexico, near the Mexican border, I guess, not in Mexico. So when he received the call that maybe the Mexican drug cartel had his daughter, it didn't seem too far-fetched. Um, and he'd come into the bank and ask for money um, and had a story. You know, the fraudsters are very smart and they know the bankers are aware and trained and they've started to really coach them um, on stories to tell. Um, and he was on the phone full time with the fraudster um, because allegedly the fraudster wanted to make sure that they weren't going to um, tell the, the bank what was actually going on to stop them from getting the money. Um, took the money in cash, I think it was $10,000. Um, jumped in the car and drove four hours to the Mexican border uh, in the San Diego area and did the money drop. Um, it was later in the day the, the fraudster um, claimed to be able to see him do the money drop, mentioned the clothes that he was wearing, told him, I want you to spend the night, go get some more cash in the morning once the banks reopen. Um, and then as he's driving home um, after that final drop, he gets a call from his daughter talking about how great the camping trip was. Just horrifying experience and, and you just can't even imagine the fear that you must feel to believe that your loved one is in danger. Um, but really there's a couple of things that um, had we had we had we known in advance we would have been able to help. Um, and we actually worked with law enforcement to come up with kind of a slip sheet 
of questions that can be written down in writing across the teller line or across something else. So if you do ever believe this is happening to you and you're afraid that you're being listened to or watched, um, you can do that type of activity. Uh, we had another case um, here, here locally um, just a, a few months back where a customer came in to get cash out to help a friend. It's not always a grandchild or an aunt or uncle. Uh, I think it was like $67,000 in cash. Um, and again, it was to help a friend. And what was done in this case is we left the cell phone sitting on the teller window um, and the branch manager had the customer walk away into the vault to have the conversation about what was really going on. And the teller carried on a conversation like everything was normal so that the client wouldn't be afraid of, of stepping away. And lo and behold, we were able to talk her out of taking that money out um, and, and stopped her from, from that. So they're, they're not always success stories, but um, as Debbie mentioned, if you do report, um, there is the chance that it could be part of a bigger um, scam and, and somebody can can get them later in. And if we're, we're discussing the, the contacts and the resources quickly here, don't worry because at the end we've got some resource slides to, to work with you on. Um, Debbie Mash mentioned, um, you know, lottery scams and some of the other uh, mass mailing scams. Oftentimes they'll come with um, a cashier's check that you think must be legitimate because cashier's checks always clear right away and they're always good. And if the bank says the money's in my account, it's in my account. Um, not realizing that these can actually be forged. Um, I gave a link to the Better Business Bureau um, release a couple of years back. They did a fantastic piece on um, how fake check scams can bait consumers. And it'll give you different examples of, of how things look. Um, cashier's checks are typically um, considered guaranteed funds. Um, and there's a lot of ways that fraudsters have come up with um, to, to falsify them. Um, we even saw a case last year where the fake cashier's check was printed on the paper with the little fibers and whatnot. Uh, it looked completely legitimate. Um, in this picture off to the right, you see this white um, microline, we call it a microline in the banking world, down at the bottom. What they had done, and this, this isn't a copy of the actual check, but what they had done is they had taken what was probably a legitimate cashier's check and photocopied it on top of this fancy paper with the fibers and all of that. Um, and they used Photoshop to create a different maker line on the check than it was actually from to try and delay the process for that check coming back as bad. Um, and I'm looking at the slide here. And what's interesting about cashier's checks is banks cannot place holds on a cashier's check for that first 5000 It's actually, as of July 1, it's now $5,525. Um, so we'll typically see these fraudulent cashier's checks in the $4,900 range. Um, and sometimes we'll see them, as um, Debbie mentioned earlier, like a work at home scam where they're purporting to have hired you. Um, and here's your first paycheck. Go deposit it with a teller. We're going to hire you as a mystery shopper and go shop the teller line. Um, and everybody's question is always, well, but it's money and it's in my account. So how can I lose money out of my account? Well, what will happen is the next day they'll ask you to send something back to them. Um, in, in this case, maybe they were going to have you go shop uh, the wire desk and ask you to send out a wire the next day. If you send that money out of that account and that check then bounces, they take it back out of your bank account. So now you're overdrawn the money that you wired out. Um, we've also seen overpayment scams um, quite often where somebody is selling a product or a service, maybe on eBay, maybe Craigslist, um, and they, they hire a moving company. So they give you a check that's $1,000 or so more than what they originally needed. And they say, oh, the movers um, are actually going to work directly for me. Can you send me $1,000 back so that I can get it to the movers? Um, all kinds of different um, scams. And rather than go through them all today, I think this link down below with the Better Business Bureau is a really great resource for you. Um, the Federal Trade Commission, you've heard us talk about these uh, repeatedly, has been doing a series of um, materials in concert with the American Bankers Association Foundation. So they've got some great infographics on fake checks. And the reason we like to give you all examples of these and these infographics and these materials is because if you have them at the ready, they can sometimes help you have that tough conversation with a loved one if they see that it's so common 
there's something that somebody has, has developed about it, they might actually listen to you when you are, are trying to convince them that they're being scammed. And it sometimes will help with those tough conversations. Um, but as I mentioned, um, this is the situation where you get the fake check, you're asked to wire the money or send it out. Um, to Debbie's point, maybe you've won something or you've gotten a grant and they want you to send money back for the fees. Um, so again, it's really um, something to be concerned about if they're trying to get you to act before that check has cleared. And just because it shows up in your deposit balance does not mean that check is cleared. Um, I really encourage you to talk to your banker uh, whenever you get um, money that you think is suspect. First of all, um, if you get money and you haven't asked for it, that should be um, advice to you right then and there that it might be a scam. Um, but allow the bank to place the holds, to wait the time period, you know, wait the week. If the fraudster is on the other phone telling you you only have 24 hours, that's probably an indicator that it's a scam as well. Debbie, did you have anything else to add on um, any kind of check scams that you've seen? Oh, Debbie, you're on mute. We've had there. I think that worked. So this says I'm muted, but I don't think I am. Um, so we've had federal federal cases on these where, especially secret shoppers and some of these work at home scams, where people again have gotten considerable time. But the only way that the federal agency, whether it's a postal inspector or the FBI or Secret Service, is going to know that about these kinds of cases is basically by doing this report. Um, and again, I have so many victims that when they get that check, they think it's real. And it's very, very difficult to tell them that they might be responsible if they, you know, put that money in the bank. And you, oftentimes they're being asked to forward most of it back to the scammer. Um, kind of as an advance on paying their taxes, which is is not the way that you know any official company would be doing things. All right, thank you, Debbie. So I love sharing this slide just because uh, last summer um, my daughter was really interested in some of the presentations that I've been doing, and she always wanted to know uh, what the latest fraud case was that that mommy had worked, and she started doing these comics to. Um, put into context how these scams work from the mind of a 12 year old and I just thought they were just brilliant. Um, there are a lot of imposter scams out there and the one that really got her was the IRS uh, scam um, um, and also the, the social security scam. And the reason she was so interested is because I would keep the recordings on my cell phone and she would play them back and listen to them. And her little mind would evaluate the red flags and point them all out. Well, mom, first of all, they, um, they, that, you're, that wasn't really your right name. And second of all, the, the, the language was bad and you know, their grammar didn't look really good. And mom, the social security doesn't call you, right? You said that the social security isn't gonna call you and tell you that your social security number has been compromised. I'm sure that we all got those phone calls at two in the morning saying that your number has been compromised. It's been implicated in fraud in order to restore your social security number um, you must pay us now. Um, so again, she, she did a series of these. She did one on a grandparent scam. Um, she did the IRS scam and Social Security. Um, ransomware we've already talked about, but also people may purport to be from law enforcement, or you may, might get a false uh, court notice to appear. Um, the robocalls just happen constantly. Um, and it's interesting because um, you can always tell when they're coming through because there's always a delay in when they start speaking to you. Um, as Debbie mentioned, one of the best things you can do is let your calls go to voicemail and then you can listen back and then you're not pressured and you can choose to call somebody back, but you can also go out of band and call a legitimate phone number. Um, there was a, a few cases last year um, that, that um, I'd heard about that Southern California Edison was being uh, impersonated. And what was happening is the fraudsters were calling people to tell them their electricity was going to get shut off if they didn't pay their $400 overdue bill. Um, and we got to listen at, at an event that Debbie and I both attended. Um, we got to listen to an actual recording of one of those, um, one of those calls because the, the victim had called 
Southern California Edison off the back of her bill at the same time the fraudster was going and she put the fraudster on speakerphone and let Southern California Edison record the whole thing. So um, it, it's great when you um, are alerted and aware of the red flags um, because really all it takes is a, just a little bit of extra homework to go out of band to verify that who you're talking to is legitimately who they are. But, you know, these government offices, and, and Debbie with her, her past experience can tell you this as well, um, they're not going to um, be, be calling you and asking you for things like your social security number or, or money. Um, those will happen probably via certified mail. Debbie, anything else to add on imposter yeah, scams? Just real quickly, especially on the IRS, um, if you find that around tax time, those are really predominating. And unfortunately, they'll, those, they will even threaten arrest if you don't you know, go out and get that gift card within the next two hours or so. And it, the IRS would never contact you making a call like that. Um, they're all government imposters. And unfortunately, it's very lucrative. And um, we just urge people just to hang up on those calls and report them if you can. Great. Um, the next thing we wanted to talk to you about a, a bit was compromised email account. We've talked about that a little bit already. Um, but it's this idea that, you know, you get that email. Um, for me, I'm on the board of a nonprofit and I constantly get text messages or emails uh, pretending to be um, the the uh, executive director saying I need wire I need money I need I need you to send me this right now and these are actual live examples um, you know little little red flag there the person that received this actually had a warning through their email account that says this might not be sent by Laurel um, and it, it shows you what that email address was right there's that's not that's not Laurel Sykes that's PeaceBot at Gmail so it wasn't me it was purporting to be me the lowercase i's, all of that. Um, but it's really important to know because we all get those emails from a friend that's in a foreign country or needs our help. And, you know, our, our, our instant reaction is to provide that help and provide that assistance. Um, but we need to go out of band and confirm with the person that it was actually sent because a lot of times people will be out hundreds or thousands of dollars by falling for these, these uh, scams. Um, another one off to the right, I need you to take care of a payment. Oftentimes what we see on these compromised email scams is kind of a first um, uh, test to see if you're a live one, right? Are you at your desk? Are you available for a call? And then if you respond, they instantly escalate into these requests for money. Um, this, this sometimes gets called the CEO wire scam because a lot of times it'll target a controller or a treasurer for an organization uh, purporting to be the CEO and you'll send the money. Um, as Debbie mentioned, these um, sweetheart scams and other scams can also be part of a larger scam. Um, I worked a case of several, several years back where it started as a CEO wire scam um, and the money was sent, I think, to a bank in Texas. And um, this poor woman who believed that she was in love and believed that she had a fiance was told to go into the bank and withdraw the cash. Uh, unfortunately, um, because the bank already had that account on warning, uh, we were able to work with the client. Um, they had to call the customer and tell them that not only are you part of a, of a crime here, but you're not really going to get married. You don't really have your second chance at love and um, just heartbreaking all around. And lastly, speaking of heartbreaking as caregiver fraud, you'd like to think that the people that you entrust to take care of you um, are going to be the ones watching out for your best interest. Um, and you see a lot of different types of cases. Um, it might be a situation where it's just somebody coming into your house to clean, um, where maybe they're, they're um, getting information to use it in identity theft. Uh, Social security number is, is one of the most expensive uh, things for sale on the dark web. Uh, but especially if it's combined with other identifying information, as Debbie mentioned, don't go online and use things like um, pet's name if it's broadcast all over Facebook as a security question, because then a couple of Google searches later and they're able to know uh, how, to, how to purport to be you. Um, embezzlement, uh, a lot of times this will be like a stolen checkbook where they're just writing checks to themselves. Um, and because they are a trusted caregiver, they're, they're probably not um, instantly detectable. Um, the bank is only going to detect these types of cases if they see them firsthand, or if it's out of, um, out of, out of order with what normally that account will experience. Um, so again, really important to pay attention to these types of, types of things. Um, 
the other other types of things we'll see is maybe you have a, a loved one um, move in and they're using your money for personal gain. Um, maybe they're off uh, using your debit card and spending money in nightclubs or um, worse yet to buy drugs um, and suddenly you don't have the money that you need to um, pay your household or other bills. Um, and these are all really tough conversations to have. We always suggest that at the holidays it's a great time to check in um, because it's a time to find out how the people that you care about are doing and maybe um, get some information on these types of cases. Um, but, but, you know, right now, it has never been a better time uh, than now to check in on people because they are isolated. Um, everyone's sitting at home. They are more likely to fall prey to these scams because there's no one to talk them out of it. Um, and because they're sitting at home and waiting by the phone and lonely, maybe they're going to be more likely to talk and divulge that information that Debbie talked to us about earlier um, just by asking a few simple questions. Um, so these caregiver camp scams can be, um, can be scary. Um, they might also come in uh, to a bank and ask to have somebody added as a signer to their account or an agent to their account. Um, and really, there's nothing a bank can do to stop that other than to potentially separate you from the person if we feel that you are in danger in any way. Um, but ultimately, it's up to you to be able to decide who to place on your accounts. And it's just really important to think about it because once they're on your account, um, there's a lot of things that they can do. Um, to, to, to steal that money. Um, as I mentioned, there are ways we can protect ourselves. Um, in addition to being aware of, of the red flags and knowing what's going on, you can place uh, fraud alerts or security alerts um, on your credit reports. What this does is if somebody has gained enough information about you, like your social security number and all your security questions, um, they might go and potentially open credit cards in your name um, that you don't know about, charge them up, and next thing you know, you have you know, a huge credit card bill to dig out of. Um, so these are really great things to think about. I did want to talk to you for a sec about uh, the difference between a fraud alert and a security freeze. A fraud alert is something that's going to be temporary and it will eventually fall off, but a security freeze can stay on in, in perpetuity. Um, or you can set it to just be in place for a little period of time. You can unfreeze it if you're going to apply for a loan. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do. There's websites that I've listed for you here in order to know how to, um, how to go about freezing your credit reports if you so choose. Um, but we also get questions about, well, what do I do about loved ones? Um, what do I do with a, with a parent who has maybe passed away and um, they still have a credit report? Um, the best you can do in those cases is report them as deceased so that it will show up on their credit report and then there won't be some sort of debt outstanding um, after that from a fraudster. For your children, you can also create a credit report file and freeze their accounts until they're ready to start using them on their own. And the reason why I say this is there's another trend called synthetic ID fraud um, where they're taking um, information from minors because they're not using their credit and they're not necessarily um, knowing what's going on. Um, and they might use information from a deceased person and create a synthetic identity in order to, to get credit. Um, you can also check your credit reports um, and you, you get access to one free credit report a year from each of these three bureaus that are down here at the bottom. Uh, phone number sometimes is preferred over a website if you're more comfortable calling them over the phone. Um, the biggest challenge I've seen is um, sometimes we can't answer the security questions they're asking us because we don't remember if it was 1992 or 1996 when we had that last auto loan. Um, so again, make sure you work with your banker if you have questions about this. And if you do ever get any emails or telephone calls about getting access to your credit report, we want to encourage you to only use the legitimate uh, free source, which is annualcreditreport.com. Here's what it looks like. Uh, if you land on a site, it doesn't look like this. It may be free temporarily, but you do want to find out um, what they might be charging you in the future after a free trial period. Um, you shouldn't have to pay $14.95 uh, $14 a month to get access to your credit reports because, as I mentioned, you can get one free credit report annually from each of the three bureaus. So a good rule of thumb, get one today from one bureau. Uh, then four months from now, get one from another. And just keep it as a practice where you're constantly checking on your own credit to make sure nothing's going awry. 
Um, remember that you will be charged to get your FICO score. If you've heard of that, um, they will charge you for that. But a lot of us banks have um, free credit report monitoring um, online as well. Uh, anyway, where you can go see what your score is. Now, it'll just be for one of the bureaus, um, but don't ever pay for your credit score because there's other ways of getting it um, that you may be able to get for free. Protecting minors and loved ones, um, I'm giving you an example here because we do get this question often, how do I help my youth, uh, my, my children um, from having their credit stolen? Um, so Equifax, each of the bureaus has information about how to um, create those freezes for your children. Um, again, you've heard Debbie and I talk about them repeatedly throughout this. Uh, hopefully by now you understand how great they are as a consumer protection source, but the Federal Trade Commission has a great article um, on child identity theft. Uh, here that you might want to check out if you're interested. Um, the Federal Trade Commission is also where you go to report identity theft. It's where you go to re report scams. Um, it's really a, a, a catch-all for, for these types of reports. And don't just stop there. I'm going to have Debbie talk with us in just a bit about reporting to IC3. There's other places where you can stay current on issues. Off to the left, as I mentioned, the American Bankers Association Foundation is doing some great things. In addition to their partnerships with the Federal Trade Commission, they've been doing a lot of work with the AARP, AARP um, to create guides, um, what, what to do with joint bank accounts. Um, they're working on right now for powers of attorney. Um, for those of you that are interested in passing information on to your friends, the Federal Trade Commission also has a great campaign called Pass It On. Um, and you can go onto their website, uh, the link's right there uh, to where to go to, and you can actually order a case of free bookmarks, free flyers that you can hand out to friends and family as they fall prey to these scams to help educate them on what the red flags are and what to do. And they're really written well um, in good, good, um, good short and condensed pieces so that they're easy to digest. Uh, off to the right, the Beware of IRS Scams, uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau on their website also has these, these resources um, and what, what they use as uh, placemats. And they deliver these to food services places or um, caregiving facilities so that as you're eating, you can read about the different scams. And I think they're just great. Um, you can also sign up on the AARP's uh, Fraud Watch Network. Uh, there's a phone number for the helpline here for if you're falling prey and what to do. Um, and you can also take a look at their scam tracking map. Um, as I mentioned, you can report um, identity theft um, what you'll be directed to is the website identitytheft.gov. It's a great site. Um, it takes you step by step through the process of what to do. Uh, Fraud.org is also great. And as we keep talking about the Federal Trade Commission, they do maintain a blog with some really great information. Um, down to the right is that link um, to file your scams at the Federal Trade Commission. Um, right here is, is a picture of some of the COVID-related scams that Debbie was talking about earlier. Um, and what we've also done at American Riviera Bank is um, we were able to get approval to repurpose some information um, from a watch group out of San Francisco and make this custom to the Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo counties. Um, but it's the common COVID-19 related scams that Debbie was talking about to you earlier. Um, the one thing that we've seen in the San Luis County um, that really isn't mentioned here um, is the uh, over, over um, the price gouging. So maybe it's not a fake mask for COVID, but they're charging you three times as much as what it should normally cost because they're trying to take advantage of the situation. Um, so this is a great resource. Uh, we have this listed on uh, the fraud page of our website at AmericanRivieraBank.com. We need the links down there at the bottom. I'm gonna have Debbie take us home with the last couple of slides and then we might have a minute or two for questions. Thank you. Um, this is actually a brand new resource that the federal government has developed and it's called the National Elder Fraud Hotline. It's open seven days a week. They speak many, many languages through interpreters. And I love that their hours are very late. And that's so important because scammers are operating seven days a week, early in the morning, late at night. So it's great to have a government agency that has victim assistance available for people. Um, and it can be there for victims. It can be there for family members or if someone that you just care about a lot is caught up in one of these and you're not sure what to do or what the next step should be get a hold of them and um, they have case managers and they can help people even fill out the, the complaint forms. They can do all kinds of things. So a great resource. Next. 
reporting cyber crimes to the FBI and the Federal Trade Commission, it's really, really critical to report, and I encourage you to report to both. Unfortunately, there is no cross-reporting between the two. So Laura's already talked about the FTC, but the FBI has also the Identity Theft, the Internet Crime Complaint Center at ic3.gov. And it's really, really important, especially if it's an internet crime, to report that there. Um, real quickly, I had a victim once of a romance scam, and she was just so hesitant to file any report at all. She was, it was huge amounts of money, and she spent months, she said, it's pointless, it's useless, I don't see any reason to do that. You've already told me they probably won't do anything. She finally did file that report, and months later, I got a frantic call from an agent in another state saying, could you please call this lady? She doesn't believe I'm a real FBI agent. We're ready to make an arrest. We really need to talk to her. So I called her up real quick. She was so thrilled and to find out that they actually do respond to some of these. Be aware it is a library of complaints, just like the Federal Trade Commission. Just because you put in that complaint doesn't mean that you're going to get an investigator. Um, to answer. They get over 1,200 reports a day. There's not enough agents or detectives in the entire world to take on that number of scams and be able to investigate each one. So it's important to fill it out as complete as you can with as much of the financial information you can to give yourself a better chance of having something that might be important on a case. Download it um, because you won't be able to access it again. You can file a report on behalf of somebody else if they're um, you know, just not able to do that, don't have the technology or even a computer to do that. Um, and realize that you can also to provide additional supplemental reports. The, the FBI actually has a recovery asset team, um, the RAT team, that actually if you have been a victim and sent money, particularly in a romance scam, work at home or something related to what we call the business email crimes, um, if you tell the bank right away, uh, they can sometimes put a stop on that, on that account. And actually, um, I have stories of people that have been able to get their money back by reporting it right away to ic3.gov as well as their bank. So very, very important. And just to finish up real quick, um, just be aware too that you can also report crimes to your local adult protective services if it's an older adult. Um, a couple other resources that might be really helpful, the Identity Theft Resource Center at www.idtheftcenter.org has some wonderful resources for people of all ages who have been victims of identity theft. And one more, and that's a new agency, a pretty new agency called the Cyber Crime Support Network. And their website at www.broadsupport.org has some great information for any victim of cyber crime, whatever their age is. So thank you very much for this opportunity, and I'll pass it back to Laura. Debbie, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your stories. Um, I hope you've all found this valuable. In looking, I do not see any outstanding um, questions. Um, I'm going to take the slide deck, um, and like we mentioned before, we'll be putting it on our uh, fraud page of our website in case you do want access um, to the links that we've discussed. Um, and we thank you so much for listening. Thank you.